Let us now learn about the internal features of the pons. We study the internal features of the pons by studying its section at two different levels. One at the lower end, one at the upper end. The section at the lower end is also known as section at the level of facial colliculus. So in this video, let us first study the internal features of the pons at the level of facial colliculus. To enable us to visualize the features at the level of facial colliculus, the section is taken at the level shown here. Please practice drawing this diagram. So firstly, along the midline, on the ventral aspect, we see a shallow depression known as basilar sulcus, along which the basilar artery is located. The posterior surface of the pons forms the upper half of the floor of the fourth ventricle with the median sulcus along the midline. Lateral aspect of the pons has a large bundle of fibers known as middle cerebellar peduncles and dorsolateral corners in the lower part are occupied by the inferior cerebellar peduncles as they ascend from the medulla to reach the cerebellum. No matter at what level you take a section of pons, it shows two parts, an anterior basilar part and a posterior tegmental part. Basilar part has a uniform design throughout the entire length of the pons, whereas tegmental part varies between upper and lower levels. So first let us consider the basilar part. Basilar part is made up of vertically descending fibers, collection of grey matter and transversely running fibers. Transversely running fibers in the basilar part appear whitish because the fibers are cut along their length whereas vertically descending fibers appear greyish because the fibers are cut across their length. Vertically descending fibers include corticospinal fibers, corticonuclear fibers and corticopontine fibers. Corticospinal fibers would have formed a compact bundle in the midbrain when they will be passing through the crest cerebri but as they reach pons they get separated into multiple fascicles because of this transversely running fibers here. The corticospinal tract fibers descend straight to the medulla where they once again form a compact bundle known as pyramids. The second group of fibers are the corticonuclear fibers. Some of these fibers relay in pons itself. The rest of the fibers descend to the medulla to relay in the medullary nuclei. Those fibers which relay in the sensory nuclei will have arrived from contralateral cortex entirely, whereas those that relay in the motor nuclei, part of them will have come from the contralateral cortex, but a few fibers will have also come from the ipsilateral cortex. This is an important feature to differentiate the facial palsy caused by upper motor neuron lesion versus lower motor neuron lesion. We will discuss that at a later stage. The third group of fibers are the corticopontine fibers. They arrive from different lobes of the cortex, hence they are named as frontopontine, parietopontine, temporopontine and occipitopontine fibers. They arise mainly from premotor, somatosensory and posterior parietal cortex, also from the extra striate part of the visual cortex and from the cingulate cortex. Comparatively, fewer fibers are there from the prefrontal cortex or from the temporal cortex or from the striate part of the visual cortex. They relay in the collection of grey matter in the basilar part which are known as pontine nuclei. These pontine nuclei are discrete collection of about 20 million neurons and they form the precerebellar nuclei. In fact, these are the only precerebellar nuclei which are located in the basal part of the brainstem whereas all other precerebellar nuclei are located in the tegmental part. These pontine nuclei, apart from receiving fibers from the cortex, they also receive some subcortical projections from superior colliculus, lateral geniculate body and pretectal nucleus, also from the dorsal column nuclei and the trigeminal nuclei as well as reticular formation. Axons of these neurons cross over to the opposite side run transversely and form the contralateral middle cerebellar peduncle. 
they project to the cerebellum as mossy fibers that is they project to the cerebellar cortex this crossing is important because cerebral cortex which is the point of origin for these fibers has contralateral representation whereas cerebellar cortex which is their destination has a ipsilateral representation now coming to the white matter in the tegmental portion immediately behind the basilar part we have a band of lemnisci that is from medial to lateral side we have the medial lemniscus trigeminal lemniscus spinal lemniscus and further laterally a fourth lemniscus which begins here known as lateral lemniscus in addition to this band of lemniscus we also have a pair of medial longitudinal fasciculus and tectospinal tracts which are located on either side of the midline dorsally central tegmental tracts and the rubrospinal tracts which are located in the lateral tegmental reticular formation area and medial to the inferior cerebellar peduncle we have the anterior spinocerebellar tracts other ascending and descending tracts will also be en route we will now consider the gray matter of the lower pons so coming to the cranial nerve nuclei we have the middle four cranial nerve nuclei located in the lower pons for the fifth nerve we have the spinal nucleus and the tract of trigeminal this belongs to general somatic afferent column receiving pain and temperature sensation from the head region for the sixth nerve we have the abducens nucleus which is located close to the posterior surface on either side of the midline this belongs to somatic efferent column and it supplies lateral rectus muscle one of the extraocular muscles for the seventh nerve we have facial nucleus which is located much more ventrally medial to the spinal nucleus of trigeminal this belongs to special visceral efferent column and it supplies all the muscles which are developed from the second pharyngeal arch in addition to facial nucleus we have another nucleus for the seventh nerve that is superior salivatory or its upper part known as lacrimatory nucleus they supply the preganglionic parasympathetic fibers to submandibular and sublingual salivary glands as well as the lacrimal gland now coming to the eighth nerve we have vestibular nucleus located along the lateral part of the posterior wall that is corresponding to the vestibular area in the floor of the fourth ventricle and we also have a pair of ventral and dorsal cochlear nuclei which are related to the inferior cerebellar peduncle at the pontomedullary junction both vestibular and cochlear nuclei belong to special somatic afferent column receiving hearing and balancing sensations now section at the lower level of the pons is also known as the section at the facial colliculus due to the peculiar course taken by the facial nerve fibers as we know the abducens nuclei are located close to the posterior surface on either side of the midline abducens nerve fibers descend ventrolaterally to exit at the pontomedullary junction just above the pyramids this nerve supplies the lateral rectus muscle now facial nucleus is located much more ventrally now facial nerve fibers first ascend dorsomedially wind round the abducens nerve nucleus and then descend ventrolaterally to exit at the pontomedullary junction this will be just above the olives so this winding of this facial nerve fibers around the abducens nucleus results in the surface elevation seen in the floor of the fourth ventricle which is called as facial colliculus and this bending of in the path of the facial nerve is known as internal genu of the facial nerve this peculiar course is explained on the basis of neurobiotaxis a phenomenon where the motor neurons migrate towards their sensory source that is in this case the facial nerve nucleus has moved close to the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve similar neurobiotaxis was also seen in the medulla in case of nucleus ambiguus now coming to the second set of nuclei these are the superior olivary nuclei which will receive the acoustic stri we will talk about trapezoid body here and the beginning of lateral lemniscus this whole system is involved with hearing pathway or auditory pathway so we have a set of nuclei 
in the lateral tegmentum, lateral superior olivary nucleus, medial accessory superior olivary nucleus, more dorsally located retro olivary nucleus and more medially located nucleus of the trapezoid body or trapezoid nucleus. Now the cochlear nerve fibers have their first order neurons located in the spiral ganglion in the internal ear. These fibers will relay in the ventral cochlear nucleus. From there there will be projection to dorsal cochlear nucleus. So cochlear nuclei will become second order neurons for the auditory pathway. From here the fibers cross the midline, most fibers cross the midline to relay in the olivary nuclear group superior olivary nuclear group. So this crossing over happens along three pathways which are known as acoustic striae. From the ventral cochlear nucleus, the fibers which will pass ventral to the spinal nucleus of trigeminal, they cross in the trapezoid body and relay in one of the superior olivary nuclei and then they ascend in the contralateral lateral lemniscus. Some of these fibers in the ventral acoustic striae will also ascend in the ipsilateral lateral lemniscus. The second group of fibers starting from the ventral cochlear nucleus itself will pass behind the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal, cross the midline to reach the contralateral lateral lemniscus. They form the intermediate acoustic stri. The fibers which start from the dorsal cochlear nucleus, which will travel first on the surface of the fourth ventricle, just deep to the stria medullaris fibers, they again cross to the opposite side and ascend in the contralateral lateral lemniscus. Now this pathway is what we call as dorsal acoustic stria. Now those fibers which do not relay in the superior olivary nuclei or some of the fibers which have already relayed in the superior olivary nuclear complex, they will relay in the nuclei of lateral lemniscus. Now Travelling through this lateral lemniscus, they reach the midbrain where they relay in the inferior colliculus. So you will notice that this auditory pathway is definitely not a typical three order neuron pathway which is a common feature for most of the pathways which are reaching the cerebral cortex. So in that way, this is an exceptional course. We will discuss about the auditory pathway more in detail in some other video. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed this video. You can visit this site for other neuroanatomy videos.